Hey everyone, it's nutritionist Amy Berger from toitnutrition.com bringing you another episode from my corner of the Ketoverse that I like to call Keto Without the Crazy. If this shirt looks familiar, it's because today is October 13th, it's a Sunday, and this is the third video I'm recording in a row. And it's just easier to keep the same clothes on. If I have a big block of time where I can bang out a couple of videos, I'm gonna do it and I'm not gonna take time to go change. Um, I wanna put out content more frequently. Hopefully you would like to see content more frequently from me and this just helps that whole process happen better. Um, I met some of you yesterday at the Adapt Your Life event in Raleigh and so, so many of you, the ones that did come up to me were um, really very appreciative of the videos and the blog and just such really great positive feedback. So I'm so glad you're enjoying this stuff. If you watch my videos, if you like the message of simple, non-crazy, uncomplicated keto, you know what to do. You can subscribe to the channel, follow me on Twitter. My handle is to it nutrition, but let's get into things. Um, I did, I did swing my hair to the front. So it, it looks like a totally different outfit now, doesn't it? I look like a completely different person. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna read the blog post like I did last time in the video on acid reflux and GERD. I'm tempted to, but this one was just way too long. If you go to my website, toitnutrition.com, I just recently did a blog post. It's called, Is, Is Insulin Messing With Your Skin? And rather than read the blog post and bore you all to tears, I'm just gonna do my best to give you the information that you need. As always, if, there wasn't a role for a carbohydrate restricted diet or a ketogenic diet in treating various different skin issues, I probably wouldn't be making a video about it. So can keto be really good for your skin? Yeah, let's talk about why. Now, before we talk about why though, I'm gonna steal a little um, quote that I have in a slide deck about keto for neurodegenerative disorders that will be on my channel eventually. It's just gonna take me a while to do that one. but. You know, those of us who do this professionally and probably you watching, even if you're just a lay person who loves keto and you're like reading all the blogs and you listen to every podcast and you watch every video, every piece of information you can get your hands on, you absorb and you want to educate yourself. You start to sound like a snake oil salesman, right? You start to sound like a real kook because whatever someone is dealing with, you want to say, do keto, try keto. You know, obviously we know low carb ways of eating, whether it's just low carb, very low carb or strict keto, we know these are slam dunks for obesity, slam dunks for type two diabetes, massive improvements in, in the need for insulin in type one diabetic, right? Type one diabetics will always need some insulin, but when you do a very low carb diet, they're able to dramatically reduce the, the doses that they need. Um, PCOS, clearly, the video I did not long ago on PCOS, keto is a slam dunk for that, a slam dunk for lots of men's health issues, you know, migraines, all, metabolic syndrome, all kinds of stuff, even things that are relatively rare, different forms of what's called glycogen storage disease. So if you happen to have one of these or know someone who does, it's, it's pretty rare, but you'll know if someone in your life has this, there's different forms. One form, glycogen storage disease type five, myocardial disease, responds really well to ketogenic diets. Some other forms do too. Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a disease of like collagen, I think, we don't really know why it seems to respond well, but people with Ehlers Danlos improve on keto. It doesn't go away, but it improves. You really start to sound like a nut. Whatever rare, weird thing someone has, oh, do keto, try keto. And you know that phrase when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. This is true. When, when what we have is the keto tool, everything looks like it needs keto. But I'm going to quote a guy that you've probably heard of. His name is Jeff Volek. He's, a, he's an RD, PhD. He works at Ohio State University. Now, he was with UConn for a long time, but he is the co-author, along with um, Dr. Stephen Finney, on the books, The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living and The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Performance. He's authored a ton of really, really key, important foundational papers establishing the efficacy of low-carb and ketogenic diets for so many of these conditions. Anyway, what Dr. Volek said, and I love it, is, you know, because well, all, right, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Dr. Volek said, Keto is a really big hammer and there are a lot of little nails out there. Whoa, that is golden. 
that's gold. So rather than plagiarize, I always give credit where credit is due. That's a Dr. Volokism, not an Amy Bergerism, but Amy Berger is going to use that pretty regularly in her presentations from here on out. Um, so let's talk about the skin. It's hard to know where to start. At some point, I'm going to put a basic sort of step one video on my channel about insulin because I know I write about this all the time on my blog. I have a, a mountain of posts about this. I don't talk about it as much on my YouTube channel yet anyway. And that is that insulin is so much more than a blood sugar hormone. Most of you might be used to hearing of insulin as the hormone that lowers the blood sugar. And that is one thing that insulin does. It's one out of like a gazillion, jillion other things that insulin does. And in my opinion, it's not even the most important. It's not even the most powerful. Um, it's just one of many, many. And so insulin, you know, if you watch that video on PCS or PCOS, if you watch the one on the men's health, the things like, uh, you know, BPH, benign prostate hyper hypertrophy or whatever, the enlarged prostate gland, the erectile dysfunction, the male pattern baldness, uh, we know that chronically high insulin is the root of metabolic syndrome, which is what? High triglycerides, um, low HDL, large waist circumference, elevated fasting glucose in some people, hypertension, high blood pressure. And so there's really no organ, gland, or tissue in the entire body that is not affected in some way by either chronically high insulin or chronically high blood sugar or blood glucose. And please know, if I ever say blood sugar or blood glucose, those are the same. Sometimes I just use one over the other, but they're the same thing. What you have to understand is that even in someone who is not diagnosed with diabetes, it is still very possible, and not only very possible, very, very extremely common to have chronically high insulin. So we're not talking about blood sugar, we're not talking about people with diabetes, although many people with high insulin also have the high blood sugar. It's, it's what's being missed in, in modern medicine and nutrition right now is, is the millions, or are, are the millions of people with normal blood glucose, maybe normal fasting blood sugar, normal hemoglobin A1C, but super, super high insulin. And it's this super high insulin that's contributing to all kinds of crazy, gnarly diseases that we don't want to have. And those things are made worse when it's coupled with the high blood sugar. But even without the high blood sugar, the high, the chronically high insulin alone is a major driver of all kinds of stuff, including a lot of skin issues. And so we know chronically high insulin is terrible for the blood vessels, for the eyes, for the ovaries, for the for the for the prostate, for for the brain. You know the my my book you can learn more about that in my book the alzheimer's antidote but why why would the skin be spared why when chronically high blood in, insulin and or blood glucose affect darn near everything else the eyes the kidneys the the nerves the the liver everything the, the heart muscle why would the skin be spared why would the skin not be affected that's the real question and so like I said, rather than read this whole thing, let me let me skim it a little bit and see what I want to talk about. But the bottom line is, if you, you know, we so often talk about oily, oily skin, acne as like because you eat too much oily food or like teenagers, you're always eating greasy food and greasy potato chips and then you're touching your face and that's why you have pimples. Not even close. Diet is related. Diet is a driver of acne and of many other, you know, skin issues, but it's not oily food does not equal oily face. Just like if you've been doing a ketogenic diet and you've lost 10, 20, 50, 100 pounds, eating fatty foods does not equal fat on the body under the right circumstance, right? So diet, yes. Oily foods, touching the face, no. Let's... Uh, so if, if you, I'm, I'm almost 10 minutes in, and let's, if you are dealing with acne, whether you're a, a, a teenager or an adult, grown adults get acne plenty, uh, psoriasis, skin tags especially, if you have skin tags, um, something called acanthosis nigricans or nigricans, you may not have heard of this, but um, if you have 
grayness or blackness or ashy looking in f places where your skin folds, like the inside of the elbow. Um, if you're overweight and you have folds, like in the skin of your neck or at the back of your neck there, the backs of your knees, sometimes also this part of the arm or even your elbow, if it's like gray or black or ashy, sometimes it actually happens in the knuckles because there's little skin folds there, you might have acanthosis nigricans if you have that. Um, there's another condition, hopefully I pronounce this correctly, hydradenitis superativa is another condition. All of those conditions were written about in my blog post, Is Insulin, where's the camera? Is Insulin Messing With Your Skin? Go to my blog, toitnutrition.com, you'll be able to find that post. And um, I will, I'll have a link to it too. I will have a link to that post so you'll have no problem finding it. You can find out all the details there, but let's talk about this stuff. A lot of this skin stuff is, you know, we tend to assume it's because of something we're putting on our skin, right? That, like that oily food or um, certain makeup products. Sorry, I live in an apartment. Somebody's honking their horn like crazy. I hope the if the video picked it up, it sounds like it stopped now. We assume, you know, maybe you're reacting to the soap you're using. Maybe you're reacting to your skin cleanser or your millions of creams that these women use. Like, Maybe it's the shower gel, something. And yes, that could be a factor. Of course, you might have a topical physical allergy or in, you know sensitivity to some compound in some of these products. Like, of course, that's an issue. If you've kind of ruled that out and you're still having all kinds of skin things that you can't explain that aren't going away, maybe you're even already taking pharmaceutical medications for them or you're doing some type of special protocol with creams and ointments and different, you know, compresses and whatever and just things aren't getting better you know take take a moment to ponder that maybe it really has nothing to do with what you're putting on the skin whether it's what you're putting on the skin is causing it or what you're putting on the skin could make it go away maybe the problem is what's coming out of the skin what is coming out of the body or what are the skin cells showing us about what's going on inside and if something that's happening on the inside is coming through to the outside and manifesting and showing us hey you wake up something's not right with me and i'm going to show you on your skin all over your body maybe the solution also is not about what we're putting on the skin and what we're doing to the skin but what we're giving the skin inside what are we nourishing the skin with what are we providing it with <clears throat> so the we know we know that hormones play a major role in skin issues right anyone that's ever gone through puberty knows that you're probably gonna have some pimples some of us are gonna have a lot more pimples than others women myself included sometimes even long past the teenage years maybe once a month like clockwork you get that one big zit on your chin or up here i get it much less often now but even now every couple of times a year I get that one premenstrual zit and it's just as long as you don't touch it it's fine it kind of goes away really fast but so we know that a lot of this is hormonal if you read my blog post or watched the video I did on PCOS acne is a major feature of PCOS because or oily skin and it has to do with the increase in testosterone in a woman driven by the increase in insulin. But either way, we know it's hormonal. Um, anyone that has hormonal acne um, kind of knows that that's an issue. And insulin, like I said, is more than a blood sugar hormone. Insulin affects so many other hormones. It's kind of like a spider web where you can't just move the one strand the one strand is connected to every other strand so whether insulin when insulin is chronically high it's doing things it's perturbing a lot of other hormones especially things like testosterone and luteinizing hormones some of these other female hormones and then um something called insulin like growth factor usually insulin like growth factor one or igf1 just another hormone in the body that's a growth factor what is acne but growth what are skin tags but growth skin extra skin protruding you i'm pointing here because it's very often found on the neck but skin tag can happen anywhere on the body they're just more common on the neck um that's growth it's sort of aberrant extra growth what are pimples 
growth? What is, um, even psoriasis, you get these kind of, some, sometimes the patches are raised, like raised scaly patches. It's growth. The skin is kind of just growing. And a lot of that has to do with the influence of ins insulin. You know, insulin is an anabolic growth type hormone, right? We know I've borrowed this. I'd like, I, I borrowed a, a quote from Jeff Volick. I'm going to borrow one from uh, Dr. Ron Hoffman. Insulin is like miracle grow for your fat cells. Well, what else is insulin like miracle grow for? Maybe your skin. So um, where, to, <clears throat> where to start? I don't want to make this video too long, even though it already is so long. Oh my God. Um, the bottom line is many, many people with skin tags, acanthosis nigricans, psoriasis, hydrodenitis suprativa, what was the other one? Acne. All of this stuff. So many of them. And, and in, in the blog post, you'll be able to click on links to all the scientific literature that's cited. So many people with all of these conditions have chronically high insulin. And they don't know it because, as I've mentioned maybe in other videos, testing insulin levels is not a routine part of standard blood work. You'll always get your fasting blood sugar tested. But remember, a lot of people have normal fasting blood sugar. You might even have a normal hemoglobin A1C. When they don't test your insulin, you look totally normal. You look healthy with regard to glucoregulation. But what's not being seen is that your fasting insulin is 46. You know, and just, just for reference before anyone asks, fasting insulin we like to see it under 10. We like it in the single digits. Under five is even better, but if you're in the double digits, you're kind of in trouble. And you can't go by standard routine labs because most labs will tell you that anything under 20 is normal, or even some labs will go as high as 25. So if you have 22, 21, you'd be normal. Uh-uh. We in the low carb and, and, and ketogenic world like to see it at least below 10, if not below five. And that's in, I think it's micro international units. So they might use something else where you live, but that, that's, if I recall correctly, under 10 micro international units is the units we use here. Um, and the thing is, it's not a slam dunk. The, the fasting insulin alone might not tell you that you have a problem with insulin because just like with blood sugar, if you get the fasting level tested, Fasting, you haven't eaten since dinner the night before. You knew you were having a blood test in the morning, so you didn't eat, you know, you didn't eat your late night snack, you didn't eat your breakfast. So your blood sugar and insulin have had many, many hours to come back down to a nice low normal. So there's a lot of people who will have a normal fasting glucose or a normal fasting insulin, but after they eat a meal, especially a meal high in carbohydrates, the glucose and or insulin are skyrocketing and they might stay elevated for most of the day. The insulin might not even come back to normal before the person's having their mid-morning snack. And then it still doesn't come back to normal before they're having lunch. And so all day they're elevated on that insulin wave. And even regardless of what the blood sugar is doing, the blood sugar might be normal that whole time the insulin is high and staying highish. And so if you're dealing with an unexplained weird skin issue, and especially if it's coupled with other things that we know run hand in hand with chronically high insulin, like high blood pressure, like difficulty losing weight, especially if your weight is around the middle. Um, what else? Maybe if you have migraine headaches, if you have gout, if you have dyslipidemia, right? The high triglycerides, the low HDL. If you have, I'm trying to think, there's so many other things um, that I, I don't even want to get into because they'll be separate videos someday. But if you have some gnarly skin things, get, get a fasting insulin test. If you don't know, if you've never had it, get it tested. If it's high, you know right off the bat, oh, okay, insulin is probably driving my unexplained odd skin thing that I've been trying to fix for 10 years, 20 years, and is never fixed because I've never tried to address the insulin. Um, if your fasting insulin is normal, then you have to dig a little deeper because you're like, okay, my insulin's normal, my blood sugar's normal. It's very possible that you fall into this category of people where your fasting level's normal, but then when you eat, it's high and it stays high most of the day. Um, and, and the other things, there, there's ways to test that that I don't even recommend doing 
I would say if you have skin tags, if you have acanthosis nigricans, if you have psoriasis, if you have hydrogenitis, I think I might have already said super TV, if you have some of this other stuff, you can kind of infer, you can assume that you do have chronically high insulin. You don't have to get tested. You could just do a low carb diet and see what happens. Um, because here's the thing, with experimenting with a low carb or ketogenic diet for some of this skin stuff, here's what I see happening. The diet is either going to help you a little bit, help you a lot, or do nothing. You're, you're not going to see any improvement, but you're not going to see a worsening. I, I'm not a doctor, this is not medical advice, but as a nutritionist, I've just about never seen anything get worse on a low carb or ketogenic diet. Things either get better or they just stay the same. So there's really no harm in trying it because if it works, great, this could change your life. If you've been living with severe acne, whether you're a teenager or you're an adult, if you have psoriasis, if you have terrible skin tags, if you have some of this stuff, that can really do a number on your self-esteem, you know? Some of these people just are so, they're just covered up all the time because, you know, in the dead of summer, they'll wear long sleeves. They don't want anyone to see their really bad breakouts or psoriasis. Um, so this can really, really diminish quality of life. So if you've been living like that, and especially if you've exhausted some of the other possibilities, if you've tried every pill and potion and ointment and packet and cream, try keto. You, you really have nothing to lose. And you might notice that so many other things you deal with clear up and go away too. Things you didn't even know were coming from the same underlying problem, that same chronically high insulin. Um, and I, I can't, I, I don't guarantee good results. Like I don't guarantee it's gonna work, but I think it's worth trying. And I can't even speculate as to how long it would take before you see a difference. You know, skin cells renew pretty quickly. That's the beauty of a skin issue with keto because I, I would imagine depending on the issue, you could potentially see a difference within days. I would, I would go at least a few weeks, if not several months, but you might start noticing a difference within such a short time that that gives you the motivation to keep going. You're like looking in the mirror, like, I think, Oh, I, I, I think this is getting better. Oh, oh my gosh, look at that. That's a little bit lighter. I don't itch as much. I'm not in as much pain. Um, and indeed, there have been anecdotal reports from tons of people with skin tags. They say fall off. I don't think they. I don't think you'll ever notice like flick. Oh, oh my God, my skin tag fell off. It's more like I think that skin just gets reabsorbed into the body and the stuff. It's just get kind of reabsorbed and those proteins and compounds are just broken down and repurposed, recycled. Um, so if you have a lot of skin tags, can they go away? Yeah. Stop feeding them. Stop giving your skin miracle grow to the point that little pips of it have to come out, you know, because they have nowhere else to go. The acne is a little more interesting. The acne has a lot more to do with that IGF-1 hormone. That's really a hormonal thing. But again, the hormone that is affecting all the other hormones that are showing themselves in the skin is insulin. And I am going to flip through this post real quick because... If you have heard of Lauren Cordain, who was the um, the guy who's really best known for the paleo diet, and Dr. Mike and Dr. Mary Dan Eads were co-authors on one of my all-time favorite papers. I guess I'll, I can put a link to that, but it's, it's linked to in the blog post I did on insulin in the skin. The post was called Hyperinsulinemic Diseases of Civilization More Than Just Syndrome X. And look, I didn't even have to look it up. I've been reading and rereading that paper for about... 10 years, if not more. And so I um, I know the title, I'm just looking for the quote from it, but the, the bottom line is that's, they explain, they explain why insulin does what it does. It, it has a lot to do with growth hormone and a lot to do with that IGF-1. And um, what else do I wanna say? Um, they see this all the time. In a lot of the research that I cited in this blog post, so many people with all of the conditions I've mentioned, whether it's acne or, or skin tags, acanthosis, nigricans, hydrogenitis, blah, 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 psoriasis. Um, and it's, it's not limited to those. Those are just the ones I specifically went into detail in this post. There's many more skin issues that, that are related to insulin. But in so many of the studies they did with patients with those conditions, when they assessed insulin, the vast majority of them were found to have that elevated insulin. And, and so many, I'm pointing there because that's where I put the printout. 
So many of them had normal blood sugar. I, I know I've said that a million times, but I cannot emphasize how important that is because doctors are missing this. Endocrinologists are missing this. The people that we count on to be the most knowledgeable, the people we count on to be the experts about this are missing it completely. And that's why medicine is failing so many of us right now. But so, so many of these people were thought to be healthy, thought to be perfectly normal because the blood sugar looks good because no one's ever testing insulin. When they do actually go ahead and test the insulin, guess what? Wow, like 90 bajillion percent of people with these conditions are hyperinsulinemic. So what do we do? Do we give them, do we give them drugs? Do we give them lotions and creams or do we bring that insulin down? And I think you and I know of at least one really good way to bring that insulin down. Now, um, that's that's one factor the other factor here is um mechanisms yeah if you want to know the mechanisms if you want to read details about those hormones read the blog post i'm not going to bore you all with it here but i have i noted something here yeah uh, i just didn't want to forget anything if you read or read or watched my blog post or video on pcos or the one about the male health issues that are tied to chronically high insulin. In both of those, I mentioned that they have studied diabetes drugs for men with erectile dysfunction and, and, and men with you know enlarged prostate and women with PCOS. Diabetes drugs, what? And just, you'll, you'll be able to see this in the blog if you read it, diabetes drugs for skin conditions. I cite, I cite several studies where they looked at rosiglitazone, pioglitazone, metformin. They looked at all kinds of diabetes drugs for people with acne, skin tags, acanthosis, nigricans, eruptive xanthomas, hydrogenitis superativa, and more. All this stuff. Um, why? Why are they studying diabetes drugs? They know. They know this is a blood sugar and or, or an insulin and or blood sugar thing. They know. If they didn't know that this was related to glucose regulation and insulin dynamics, why would they even waste time and research dollars, which are hard to come by? Why would they waste it looking at diabetes drugs for the skin? They know this, now you know it too. And so you could take a diabetes drug or you could do a low carb diet. Like you could take a diabetes drug even though you don't actually have diabetes or you could address the root problem. If the root problem is high insulin, maybe stop eating foods that are skyrocketing your, skyrocketing your insulin all day and keeping it there. Now I have to find one more thing. Oh, I remember. I wrote a section that I might actually just read this one section because it's that important in my opinion anyway. Diabetes, where is it, where is it, where is that? Okay, so this is after, I, I am just going to read a little section of it. It was after I was talking about the use of diabetes drugs for these conditions. Some of the studies employing diabetes drugs for skin problems have shown little to no improvement in the conditions. What a shock. Most of these drugs are intended to improve blood glucose levels, some of them by actually increasing insulin levels. This is exactly what you would not want in these situations. If you don't address the fundamental cause, chronically high insulin, then you can't expect to have all that big an impact on the problem, right? This is why, this is why so many people with type 2 diabetes who get put on more and more medications, ever increasing doses, yet they continue to get worse because there is zero addressing of the actual problem. So yeah, take a diabetes drug and cover it up or fix the problem. What this entire post points to is that dermatologists are in a unique position to identify chronic hyperinsulinemia in its early stages, long before it progresses to full-blown metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, or cardiovascular disease. One paper states this in no uncertain terms, and again, the link to the paper is in the blog post, quote, being aware of such clinical signs and the underlying systemic disorders may facilitate earlier diagnoses, thereby permitting earlier initiation of earlier therapy initiation and prevention of long-term sequelae. 
In this process, dermatologists are key figures in the early detection of metabolic syndrome and its clinical manifestations. If these cutaneous, cutaneous meaning the skin, if these cutaneous issues are early warning signs of metabolic syndrome, doctors can inform their patients that elevated insulin is driving their skin issues and that there's something they can do about it, such as adopting a low carb or ketogenic diet. Just as erectile dysfunction of otherwise unknown origin might be the first clinical sign of metabolic disease in a man, these skin problems can be the canary in the coal mine indicating pathological processes going on internally, particularly in people with few other biomarkers that would indicate this nefarious metabolic situation. Meaning, well, let, let me read, let me read one more and then we'll. Fasting insulin and HOMA IR testing should be routine in a dermatologist's office. These doctors can offer patients an endless array of creams and ointments, laser therapies and light treatments, but perhaps patients might be better helped not by what they put on their skin, but by addressing what's happening internally, inside and underneath the skin. Visible manifestations of underlying hormonal imbalances can't be permanently corrected by topical application of medicinal products. The root cause must be addressed. If the driving factor is a hormone imbalance, then the hormone imbalance needs to be corrected. Now, when I say that dermatologists are in a unique position to tell someone, hey, you are at risk for diabetes and metabolic syndrome and fatty liver and cardiovascular disease and PCOS and erectile dysfunction and all this other stuff, they can do it by saying, hey, wait a minute, this, this 21 year old person has acne or this 24 year old person has acne. They're long past puberty. Why do they have acne? They're overweight, you know, oh, oh sorry, they're, they're at a normal weight. That's the thing too. We don't normally suspect people at a normal, I hate that phrase, but at a normal weight to have metabolic syndrome type problems or type two diabetes type problems. We kind of have this bias and this knee jerk assumption that that stuff only happens in overweight and obese people, right? It doesn't. I write and talk about this all the time because we have such a stigma in our society against heavy people. We assume, oh, well, you have acne because you're fat. You have skin tags because you're fat. Guess what? Thin people get acne too. Thin people even can have skin tags. Thin people can have psoriasis. They can have all this other stuff. So in, in the post that I did and the video I did on men's health, they, there, there was a paper where the researchers basically said something like, erectile dysfunction can be the first sign of impending metabolic and cardiovascular disease in a young person with no other reasons to suspect that this is going on. It's like, the one sign it's a very early warning sign so whatever age you're at whatever body size or shape you're at if you have one of these skin things that doesn't seem to go away no matter what you do that you can't explain um it could be it could be insulin and especially if you do have some of the other things we know insulin is is behind right if you are overweight or especially if you're obese if you do have fatty liver if you get migraines if you have gout you know if you have erectile dysfunction if you have pcos if whatever whatever um then and and in addition to that you have acne or skin tags or psoriasis or you know all this other stuff insulin is probably the issue and you know the dermatologists can can figure this out like there's a lot of um ophthalmologists the the eye doctors who are the first ones to diagnose type 2 diabetes because when they do the exam and they look at the retina the eyeball right the, the retina some in some people they will have retinal damage before their fasting glucose is even elevated before you even have the signs in the blood work that the person is diabetic, the eyes will show it years before. Sometimes even my, huh, well, I, I, I was going to share a little anecdote about my mother. That's how my mother found out she was diabetic. Her gynecologist too, like she, they basically told her she had PCOS, but this was like 30 years ago. They had no clue what to do about it. Like, oh, you have PCOS. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, Anyway, I don't mean to laugh, but that's, that's how sad, that's how ridiculous it is that, that, that this is what goes on. But just like an ophthalmologist can be in a unique position to identify massive blood sugar problems long before it even shows in the blood, a dermatologist 
can be the one to tell an 18 year old, a 22 year old, a 30 year old that you have a major problem with insulin long before that has to become type two diabetes or cardiovascular disease or Alzheimer's disease or a stroke or PCOS, right? You can nip this in the bud at a young age or in an early stage, right? If you are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old watching this, I don't mean to put so much emphasis on young people, just young people tend to be the ones with acne. But of course, acne and any of the other conditions I've mentioned can affect people of any age. But it's just, it's all really fascinating. And uh, like I said, if you want to understand the details of the mechanisms, just read the post that's linked to. But it, again, you have nothing to lose by trying keto. Maybe you have 20 pounds to lose, or maybe you have migraines to lose, or gout attacks to lose. Um, it's just so fascinating to me. Like I said, you know, keto is a really big hammer, and there's, well, this is like Dr. Volick said, keto is a really big hammer, and there's a lot of little nails out there. And I just think, Knowing what I know now about how many different things insulin does in the whole entire body and how many different things the ketogenic diet does, like someday, again, I'll have a video that's just, just devoted to what does the ketogenic diet do? Why does it work for epilepsy? Why does it work for migraines? Why does it work for obesity? Why does it work for type 2 diabetes? Why might it? Why is there potential for it to help with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and stuff like that? Why does it bring blood pressure down so well? Why does it do all this good stuff? Knowing what I know about all the stuff insulin does and all the stuff keto does, you kind of have no reason not to give it a try. Rob Wolf, you guys know who Rob Wolf is? He's He calls it his greasy used car salesman pitch. Take, get, give it a drive. Give it a test drive for 30 days, 60 days. Take her out for a whirl. See how you do. That's all you can do. Try keto. Give it, if you have a skin thing, give it at least maybe two months. If you don't notice a difference and you don't like keto, go back to your old diet. But I think you probably will notice a difference. I would imagine two months would be enough time to see it. Maybe it's not, but two months might be enough to see at least some improvement. To see enough of a change that you're like, yeah, I think I think this is doing something. I'm going to stick with it another two months or another six months and then decide at that point. I just, I'm, I'm not a proselytizer. You know me. I, I've, I've had clients that I've worked with can verify. I've had clients I've told to eat more carbs. I don't think everyone needs keto. A lot of us do, or a lot of us need some version of low, low-ish carbohydrates. So um, it's worth a try. It's just worth a try. And what have you got, you know, like I said, what have you got to lose? Why, why wouldn't you try it? I don't know. I guess that's it. Um, I'm not sure when this video will air, so I'm not really going to shout out to any specific events I'll be at soon. If you want to see where you can meet me in person, go to my website, too, at nutrition.com. There's a tab that says meet me in person, so you can see upcoming events there. You can also find a tab there that says work with me if you're interested in a consultation. And if you like my work, if you want to help me keep doing these videos, you can support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash two at nutrition. You can support for as little as $2 a month. That's like one cup of coffee a month. You can support me at that level. $5 a month and above gets you uh, early access to blog posts. When I write a new blog post, you'll be able to read it a few days before the rest of the world. Um, $10 and above is another uh, reward. It's a research review. I give you a review of the, the scientific papers I've read that month. That's it. Or if you don't like Patreon, but you still want to support um, my ability to spend time doing these videos and writing these posts, you can send me any amount you like on PayPal, paypal.com. You can send that to my email address, toitnutrition at gmail.com. Any and all amounts are welcome. Um, you know, all this time is unpaid. And I, I do love learning about this stuff, but somebody's got to keep the lights on. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you watching these videos. I love the positive feedback that I'm getting. I mean, I wouldn't keep doing these if I didn't think people were watching, if I didn't think people were benefiting. So I do plan to do some shorter videos because I know not everybody's gonna sit here and watch like a 40 minute video about the skin. Not everyone's gonna watch an hour long video about, uh, you know, acid reflux and GERD. Like, so I wanna start doing little snippets. I'm just gonna have to see how to do those, how to keep them short and sweet, but worth watching, how to give 
enough information, but not too much so that the video is 15 minutes long. I'm talking definitely under 10 minutes. Shutting up now. I'm out. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for watching.